Right, and now I'm going to turn it over to Ebony Tyler from Liberated Success. So welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for um, dropping what your your name and your pronouns and what you're interested in learning about careers in the chat. I appreciate that. So welcome to Succeeding in the Workplace. Uh, this is a five part webinar series presented by Liberated Success. And um, like Ashley said, my name is Ebony Tyler and I'm the founder of Liberated Success. And we are a youth career um, development nonprofit. And, I created this organization to support young people ages 14 to 24 years old in their career journey. And um, I've worked with young people in the capacity as a vocational counselor and as a work-based learning um, program administrator, which is an internship supervisor um, coordinator for over 20 years. And what I noticed is that um, young people um, can learn the technical skills related to a job but um, sometimes keeping the job and progressing in a job can be a struggle if you don't have the right tools or strategies. So this workshop series will focus on building your toolbox with skills and strategies that you can apply in any work setting, any internship or any um, college setting. So um, we're gonna be here for the next five, um, um, every other Tuesday and I'm at 445. And um, each week we'll dig, in, um, dig deep into one of these topics. So today we're gonna start with um, communication and workplace culture, uh, workplace technology. Uh, week three, we'll go over teamwork and collaboration. Uh, week four, maintaining a positive attitude. And in week five, um, praise, criticism, and feedback. And these sessions are uh, really designed to uh, participate for you to participate. Um, so what I love if you you know share your thoughts by unmuting yourself and sharing your voice with us, or um, commenting in the chat because we learn best um, when we learn from each other. So um, I always like to start off with community agreements, right? Um, and this is the agreements that, because we're in community with each other um, over the next 60 minutes, right? So, you know, be present, right? We're sharing this virtual space with, you, with each other for the next uh, 60 minutes. And, you know, be here, um, fully enjoy the experience, right? This is our time with each other so that we can learn from one another. Um, next one is to be curious, open, and respectful, right? Um, we wanna call, call each other in and not out. Right, I like to take, let's throw sunshine and like not shade at each at each other, and then assume best intent. Right, give people the benefit of the doubt if there is um something that you hear that makes you think you know did they did they just say that or um you know you can ask people to elaborate um on a statement maybe say something like um can you tell me a little bit more about this, and then take some space and make space right. You want to hear everyone's voices, um, and if you're usually quiet, I challenge you to uh, bring your voice in your in the room, right? And if you talk a lot, um, I challenge you to be a little mindful and to leave space for like our quieter colleagues who are on the conversation. And then one mic, right? It's always hard to hear if we're all chatting at the same time. And then let's speak from our own um, experience, right? Use I statements rather than generalizations. And um, is there anything that anyone would want to add to this while we're here? And you can drop that in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Okay, so uh, how about Give me a quick thumbs up if we can live with these agreements for the next 60 minutes. All right, great. Thank you. So um, the reason why, you know, it's important for us to have some community agreements on, online is, um, you know, if we start governing ourselves by this when we're on virtual spaces, it'll just translate into the work environment. So again, thank you for introducing yourself in the chat. And um, some, uh, some folks have um, introduced themselves and we have Yorleni, 
says that um, she would like to learn how to communicate better. Thank you. And that's what we're gonna talk about today is communication. And we have Alexa, and she says that she's looking to learn more about how to help communicate um, better in, in business and with others. And um, Yui, am I saying your name right? He um, says that they're not sure what they wanna learn. And then we have um, Hadia, who says one thing that they wanna learn about is preparing for a career is how to improve soft skills and hard skills to build up a resume. And um, I'm, I love that you said uh, soft skills because that's really what this workshop series is about, right? Like this is about all the soft skills that, um, you know, no one always teaches us how, 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 to, how to show up in a work setting. So that's um, part of why I uh, created Liberated Success and why I love uh, doing these types of workshops. And um, Lucas uh, says that they're here to um, absorb information. So welcome everyone. Um, and then we have Catherine who says um, that they just wanna know more about more things that, might, that they might need in the future. So um, we're all, you're, all of you are in the right place today and I'm really excited to get started. So um, in today's uh, session, we're gonna discuss communication and workplace culture and understand the differences in communication styles and what workplace culture is and why it's a, um, an important concept to understand. So welcome to work uh, communication and workplace culture. And these are our learning outcomes for today is we wanna, uh, by the time you leave, you should be able to define and understand the process of communication, understand the four types of uh, communication, recognize the different types of communication styles, understand what cultural cues are, and identify some strategies for conflict resolution and how conflict may show up in the workplace. So let's jump right in into, into communication. So communication, it's the exchange of thoughts of our opinions or information by speech, writing and behavior. And communication is vital to the success of any relationship, both in our personal lives and in the workplace. So communication can assist in the breaking down of barriers between opposing sides to reach a common goal. And communication is a process, okay, um, in which we create and convey a message. And there's four types of communication. We've got verbal, nonverbal, written, and listening. And listening is part of the communication process. And we're gonna explore each of these communication modes and how they show up in the workplace. So right now, I'm going to drop a Padlet in the chat. And I'd like you to give an example of verbal, nonverbal, written, and listening communication. And we're going to uh, frequently come back to this. So is everyone able to see the Padlet or get access to it? Yeah? All right. That means I did it right. Thank you, Lucas. Appreciate the thumbs up. No problem. So just go ahead and give us an example of a verbal communication, right? Like what that what what does that look like? Nonverbal, written, listening, and we'll uh, frequently come back to it throughout um, today. All right, so um, let's go through the basic elements of communication. And if you have questions, feel free to um, drop your questions in the chat or unmute and uh, let's have a discussion. So the basic elements of communication include the sender, right? That's the individual or the group who sends the message. And then the message, that's the thought, the idea, the opinion, right? What the sender has encoded and wants to convey. And then we have the channel, the portion of the communication process which carries the message to the desired location of how we send the message. And then the receiver, who's the target, and then feedback, which is the response of the message. So the communication process refers to the steps taken in order to, to successfully send and receive a message. Now, we don't 
always think about these steps, right? Like they're just innate, right? You think about it, you process it, you transmit it. But let's let's kind of break these 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 um let's let's break up the process, right? The cycle so that we can really understand about it. So thinking, right? That's the initial step in the communication process. And it involves the source or the sender generating the information intended to be shared with others, right? So the first step is like, I'm going to think about what I want to say to the person. And then encoding, right? Is that's the process of the transforming of the information to be conveyed into a transferable form. The communicator translates the thoughts into a series of verbal and nonverbal actions, which will communicate the message to the intended receiver. So that's like how we're going to get the message across. And transmit it involves selecting the appropriate channel of, of communication for the message delivery. And the message channel refers to the medium in which the message is going to be sent from the receiver to the receiver, right? So we're going to speak. Is it going to be writing? Is it going to be a video? Is it going to be an audio? It's the way that we're going to get the message across. And the receiving is the stage which involves the reception of the sender's message by the intended individual or audience. And the messages may be received in the form of, you know, hearing, seeing, and feeling. So we may have to use our senses um, when receiving information. And then lastly, the decoding. Um, decoding, that's the process um, that the receiver takes to mentally process a message in order to understand what the sender is communicating. And effective communication can only occur when the sender and the receiver assign the same or similar meaning to the message. So it's in the hopes, right, that you both have a shared uh, common language to be able to receive information. And then feedback, that's the final step in the communication process. And that refers to the response the receiver offers to the message. And this could be communication or behavior. Um, so like how many times have you read something and then you physically respond to it, right? That's, that's a feedback of the message. So that can include, you know, people's facial expressions or body movement. So uh, did everyone have a chance to um, put something on the Padlet? I don't, I don't see anything. I, I see people on it. If anyone wants to share what is a, what would be an example of a verbal communication? I wasn't sure if we were supposed to do that while he was talking, but I had it. I just felt weird for it just now. I don't know. Um, I can't hear you. Can you repeat it? I wasn't sure if we were supposed to be doing that while we were typing. Yeah, so you I can type, it. but yeah. you're 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 um sharing your voice with us. So go ahead, give me an example of a verbal communication. Well, 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 I'm just talking like we are right now, using electronics to uh, transmit the verbal the words. The sound in the air, that's verbal communication. You understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Anyone else? Right, so thank you for that, Lucas. So verbal communication, right? It, re it relies on the spoken word to share information with others, right? And the dialogue is a form of, of verbal communication. So, um, Verbal communication is successful um, when it will engage and motivate people. Um, so it can happen at its own pace. Verbal communication, it allows for emotions to be transmitted and it, and it allows for immediate feedback to be provided. So verbal communication, right? It can take in the form of face-to-face -face discussions, speeches, television, radio shows, podcasts, seminars, training, telephone calls, workshops, right? They're all a form of uh, verbal communication. Um, and then if we're um, thinking about um, our friends who may be hard of hearing, right? We can put on the closed captioning so that they can also partake in the, in the verbal communication, even though it may show up as written to them. So some effective strategies for um, verbal communication that involves speaking clearly, um, listening carefully to ensure that the information is understood, 
and asking questions and confirming the meaning of information to avoid misunderstanding. And then also letting others talk, right? It's a two-way, com um, a conversation is two ways, right? How many times have you been in a conversation with someone and they don't pause to let you respond or for you to talk? It's kind of a one-way um, dialogue. So some of the pros and cons around um, verbal communication is that if the message, you can get like a high important, a message that's like of high importance, you can, you can send that off, you know, you can communicate that quickly. Um, if the receiver doesn't really know you that personally, you can, you know, still share some information, help you build a rapport with that person. Um, if you need a response right away, you can um, use verbal communication. And then some cons may be like, if there's like a language barrier or if you're in a fast paced situation um, and it's inconvenient for you to be able to, to share that. All right, um, any questions about uh, verbal communication or any comments? So I'm looking at the Padlet and um, thank you for um, sharing on here, using sounds to exchange information like calling with a cell phone or talking or talking on the phone um, and just talking in general. All right, so let's move to nonverbal communication. All right, so nonverbal communication, it's sharing information without using words to encode messages. And the four basic elements are proxemics, kinesthetics, facial and eye behavior, and paralanguage. Um, does someone ever, I don't know, maybe in your experience, do you think that you can um, think what's, what somebody's thinking about just by looking at their face, right? They haven't said anything, but you can kind of guess a little bit, right? Because of the nonverbal language, right? So proxemics is the study, that's the first one. That's the study of individuals' perception and the use of space. And so examples could include um, territorial space and seating arrangements. So in a work setting, right? If you wanna um, encourage cooperation, uh, coworkers, they may sit next to each other, sit in a common area, but of course, Right, we're in COVID time, you know, we wanna follow COVID precautions, you know, when sitting next to people. But, you know, in a work setting, if you're working on something with people, you kind of wanna be together because it kind of fosters community, right? And then if you're working virtually, um, I don't know if, if some of you are in-person learners or if you're remote learning, um, but like since COVID has started, you know, since we're in this COVID space, um, I do a lot of work virtually. So I like to make sure that like, I'm on the same document as my coworkers when we're working, right? Cause that, that shows that I'm, in, I'm engaged with what's happening, even though I may not be saying anything, but at least they know that like I'm present. Um, uh, kinetics, that refers to body language, which can be used to convey meaning and messages. So examples includes like pacing, you know, drumming your fingers, twiddling your fingers. Um, they may show like signs of nervousness, right? So you can tell what's going on with someone sometimes without them even sharing that information, right? Wringing of hands, you know, somebody's stressed or like, oh my gosh. Um, and then we have facial um, and eye behavior. So that refers to the motion or the position of the muscles beneath the skin in your face, right? Eye contact and movement, right? Smiling, frowning, eye rolling. Um, a lot of these things sometimes can be, you know, misinterpreted in the workplace if we're not mindful and paying attention to like how we show up with our face. Like, so you always wanna make sure that you're like conveying a message to people. So, you know, working virtually, I like to always like adjust to make sure like I'm sitting up, not necessarily like this, right? Because if I'm like this, if I'm in a meeting, um, I may not look like I'm interested. Except for you, Yui, 
you look like you're focused. I see you. You got you're like this, but you look like you're paying attention, right? So um, it's all about like sometimes how we position ourselves um, because you want to be able to convey that you are um, paying attention, you're engaged, you're here. And then paralanguage refers to the non-lexical component of communication by speech, right? So that's the, the quality of your voice, the volume, the speech rate, right? The pitch, so you go up, you go high, right? That also sends a message. So um, when I first started giving presentations, uh, I would say like, I'm from Brooklyn, so I talk fast, but then it's like, okay, I'm from Brooklyn, I talk fast, but I have to pace myself and talk a little slower sometimes to make sure that everything that I'm trying to convey is getting across. So if you know that like you're a fast talker, you may want to slow down sometimes when you're in, um, you know, work situations. So when thinking about nonverbal communication in the workplace, we want to focus on our body movements, our appearance, eye contact, gestures, posture, facial expression. So let's see, I'm looking at the Padlet and we've got um, some examples of nonverbal communication. Um, waving to someone to say hello, perfect example. Um, types of nonverbal communication is facial expression, body language, eye contact and gest gestures. We also have te texting, sign language, drawings, writing things. Um, and, uh, written things and body language. Yes, all of these are great examples of nonverbal um, communication. So just to recap, nonverbal communication is body language. Therefore, whether it's in an interview, in a presentation, an important meeting, you're establishing you know, rapport with um, a, a new coworker or somebody you, know, you just um, came in contact with, or you're like you're in a social setting, you want to have positive body language, right? Because it makes a big difference because it reveals your feelings, your strengths, your fears, your hopes, your intentions, right? And it seems like that's a lot, but that's kind of, that's what our body gives off. And then people will make um, assumptions or they'll draw conclusions about um, who they think you are. So some strategies um, for effective nonverbal communication is again, caring about your appearance, maintaining eye contact, smiling, nodding when you're listening, being aware of your posture, using appropriate gesture, gestures. Because um, again, we want to convey with our body that we're, we're interested in what's happening. So um, some pros and cons about um, nonverbal communication. Um, so, so some pros are that it's self-expression, right? It reinforces verbal written communication and allows for some feedback. And then the cons is that it can lack um, complexity and um, limited distance, right? I mean, we can, we know the universal gesture of waving, but um, if we're like upset and someone's all the way across, they may not be able to pick up on um, those clues. Any questions or comments, concerns, or want to add any thoughts about nonverbal uh, communication before we move to the next one? All right. Okay, written communication. So written communication is more appropriate for describing details, right? Especially if it's very technical in nature. So text messaging, social media, email, right? That's the most common uh, form of written communication in most workspaces. And it allows for messages to be rapidly created, changed, saved. It can be sent to many people. And like I said, email is like also the preferred uh, communication channel and coordinating uh, work schedules in the workplace. And we're gonna talk a lot about email um, at our next section, session when we talk about uh, workplace technology. So um, resumes and um, teams to post chats and reports and memos are also um, forms of written com communication. So um, looking at the Padlet, we've got um, using a link um, and paper to write characters with meaning to be read 
could be used to convey what you're feeling. Thank you, Lucas, for that. Um, UI says um, texting, email, post-it notes, and letters. Padilla says writing a note, mail, email, text, letters and texting. Yerlini says Catherine includes sending letters, writing texts, maybe little notes, right? Um, do people still write little post-it notes and leave them around? Yes, no, yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, actually, I sure do. Yep, so do I. I got them all over the place. Um, so some strategies for um, effective written communication, right? It involves making sure um, of the content, right? You want it simple and easy to understand. You want to be polite, concise, use correct spelling, grammar, and tone. Um, you want to be to the point and avoid unnecessary repetition, long rambling sentences. Um, avoid, you know, lots of technical terms, avoiding slang, offensive behavior, right? A rule of thumb is that electronic messages can be forwarded, they can be shared, they can be screenshotted. So we, we want to be mindful of what we're putting in written communication, right? Whatever you're writing, um, you know, on an email, social media, you guys grew up with social media, right? And with the cell phones, you want to just assume that everybody's going to see it, that there's nothing personal, and especially in the workplace, right, when we're using email. So some pros and cons about written communication is that um, it helps the receiver remember the information, right? They can recall what you've written. The information is clear. It's precise. There's no need to repeat it. Right, you can always go back in your email and reference what um, the, the person said. Um, let's see, what else? Um, electronic email, right? That has a lot of concern. There's problems with email, right? It can be information overload. Some people get a lot of emails in their email every day. Anyone can attest to getting lots of email? every day and that it's sometimes it's not it's not even relevant to relevant to you right um so sometimes we want to like limit the types of you know if we're going to be bombarding people with a lot of um, messages in their email right um also you know with email you can pass on commu uh, computer viruses and then also um written communication through email is ineffective to communicate emotion, right? You don't really know if someone's really upset or they're happy unless you like you, if you know them, right? You know their writing style. And then sometimes emails can uh, cause a misunderstanding between the sender and the receiver. Um, any concerns about um, written communication, uh, pros and cons? No? Okay. All right, listening. So listening, right? That's the final step in the communication process. And it's listening is, is a mode of communication, right? So listening skills are just as important as speaking. Um, and it allows for a full understanding of what the other party and what their response is. And it's vital for building strong relationships. Um, it involves fully understanding and constructively responding to what the other party is communicating. And again, listening is part of the communication process. It's a process and it, it, it can include, you know, just not using our hearing senses, but our sight as well, the ability to perceive sound and sight, the ability to see what's being communicated by people who use sign language. And then focusing, um, keeping attention on the message and understanding and comprehensi comprehending the meaning of the message. So lastly, on the Padlet, we um, some examples of listening, uh, voice messages, listening to the voice messages, songs and calls, hearing a person when they're speaking, possibly music or hearing um, someone through the phone. Um, paying attention and, and responding after listening, asking questions to better understand. And one-sided type of communication, listening is to receive information. Listening is usually used because one is listening carefully. 
So thank you for all of those responses about um, listening and written verbal, nonverbal communication. Any questions or concerns? Nope, okay. So communication styles, right? People's, have you ever noticed that sometimes two people could be saying the same thing, but they're not hearing each other because of the communication style? Yeah, some nods, okay. So um, a lot of misunderstandings can happen in life because of communication styles, right? And the communication styles refer to the way a message is conveyed, whether it's communicate, communicating through speech or another message. The style impacts how much of what is being said will be understood and accepted. And so some examples of communication styles are assertive, aggressive, passive, and passive aggressive. Which one have you heard of the most? Passive aggressive. Yes, passive aggressive. Yes. All right. So let's just uh, dig a little deeper about what each um, communication style is. And it's really important that we're able to recognize these communication styles. Um, so that way we know how to respond to them. Okay. So assertive communication that is characterized by trying to reach a mutually agreed upon solution. And it, in, it involves um, a familiar way of expression and communication. And this is typically described how, you know, normally people would uh, communicate, right? So you, you, there's, there, there's, you know, some type of situation and two people are talking about it um, and they're confronting it right on to, to be able to figure out a solution. So that's assertive communication. Uh, the second one is aggressive communication, and that can involve manipulation in order to achieve the end goal, right? Sometimes people may like try to use guilt or intimidation and that doesn't include any type of compromise, right? It's just allows for um, like, there's a person like, this is what I want and this is how we're gonna get it, how I'm gonna get it. Um, so it allows for people to know really how the other person truly feels. And then we have passive communication and that's based on avoiding the confrontation. Right, so that's characterized by not really reacting, not really standing up for yourself, or you know, not really being noticed. And um, a person may, you know, remain kind of quiet, don't really want to get involved, um, not really saying how they feel, uh, not really making, you know, their their opinion or their voice known about this the particular situation. And then lastly, passive um, aggressive communication. So that's a combination of passive and aggressive, right? The two of those together. And it includes a desire to avoid the conflict, but also it tries to manipulate the situation, right? So that the outcome is in the person's favor. So it's really important that we're able to recognize these communication styles. Um, so again, it'll allow us to know how we should maybe adjust our response. Um, does anyone maybe want to share a scenario or, you know, something that they've seen that they thought maybe was passive aggressive, like in the workplace or, you know, just to maybe give us an example? Nothing? That's okay, that's all right. Um, something that I've seen sometimes in the workplace is, um, you know, sometimes your coworker may ask you to do something and you don't really wanna do it. So you'll be like, uh, oh, okay, right? Um, and then maybe kind of like talk about it, you know, to other people that can be considered like a passive aggressive situation. All right. Um, so cultural cues, anybody have any um, thoughts on maybe what they think cultural cues are and how the, these things may show up? No? Okay, no problem, right? So um, sometimes, right, like when we start a new job, a new internship, a new school, right, you could be filled with like 
anxiety, right? And it's helpful if the, the new organization that you're going to write, the new job, the new internship, the new school, would share information about what to expect before your official start date. But sometimes that doesn't happen, right? You know, um, like what time should you arrive? Where should you log on? What floor? You know, some of those questions, people, it will help to relieve some anxiety, right? But it doesn't always happen, right? So, you know, asking questions helps to integrate yourself into the culture of an organization. And really what it is, is how do you fit in, okay? And um, once you get a job and you're offered the position, the supervisor, the employer, they're offering you the position because they know that you can do it, right? Like you have the technical skills to do it. But also they may think that you're a good fit for the work environment, right? So I once went on a job interview and the boss said, like, um, we just want to make sure that we work with people that we like. That's fit, right? It's how do they think that you're going to fit in, right? And cultural cues play into this. So um, cultural fit is described as the likelihood that you'll conform and adapt to the core values of the collective behavior of the work environment. Now, this is not something that people like openly talk about, right? Like if someone fits into something, right? But you usually hear about it when the person is no longer there, right? They'll say, oh, they really didn't fit in here. And you know, that's really about personality. You know, again, how do you conform to the collective work environment, right? Do you fit in? Do you stand out? Are you able to, you know, interact well with people? Um, so again, you know, employers and supervisors, they're looking for people that are gonna fit into the organization, but you, as the person who's gonna work there, you should also decide if you think that you'll be a good fit, right? Because you're gonna be spending a lot of time at said work environment. And some things that you can look for, right? Like understanding cultural cues, it's, it's just, it's all about observation, right? And it's, it goes back to that nonverbal style of communication, right? And it's about like understanding what the vibe of the work environment is, right? So things that you should look for. Are the coworkers friendly? Are they, are they courteous to each other? Do people smile? Um, how do people dress at, at that work environment? Um, do you feel comfortable there? Do you feel safe? Um, are there opportunities for you to grow in a work environment, right? And I always like to say, like, pay attention to your gut, pay attention to how you feel in a work environment, right? Um, what's the personality like of the person who interviewed you? Um, your interactions with your supervisor, right? Um, you don't want to make assumptions. You, can ask, you should ask questions if you're unsure about things, but you know, cultural fit, cultural cues, it's all about observation. And then again, how do you fit in to that particular place? Um, curious about you know, questions or, or comments about this, because I don't find that this is something that's readily talked about in um, workspaces about how do people fit? So curious about um, people's thoughts on this. Um, I think that that when people that don't feel like they fit in in their job, they probably like leave it and quit. Yeah. Right. Like if that causes some type of conflict, right? It could, it could be like an internal conflict or it could be an, an actual outward conflict if you don't feel that you fit in, okay? And um, this is not to say that like you have to conform, but I want you to know what supervisors or employers are thinking, right? All right, so in a perfect world, there wouldn't be any disagreements, right? 
communication between supervisors and subordinates, right, employees, it would be perfectly understood and coworkers, they would always try to help each other and there'd be no complaints from customers, right? But in reality, conflict is inevitable in the workplace and conflict can be costly for businesses, right? Um, it can be costly for an organization, right? Um, you just, young lady just said that um, you may want to leave, right? If you're feeling um, that you don't fit in in the job. So that can also cost um, the employer or the business because they have uh, people who are not showing up to work, right? So it can result in lack of motivation, a reduction in productivity, and a loss of a skilled employee. So the con there's some, some consequences about conflict in the workplace, right? And that's not, some of the consequences are like, like work may not get done to maximum efficiency, right? It can be stressful, right? And sometimes, and we know stress can cause health problems. Uh, again, lost time, people not showing up for work, people getting sick, people not wanting to be at their workstation, right? But conflict, it's a disagreement and it's perceived and it can be solved. And so conflict, whether it's real or perceived, right? Because the person thinks that this is happening, right? So it's perceived. Um, and it can, it can escalate because there may be different opinions with the parties that are involved, right? So once people in conflict realize that there's a difference, then they have to work to try to understand each other to be able to solve the problem. And conflict in the workplace generally involves two, two parties and it can be amongst um, inter, in, uh, individuals, right? It can be some type of interpersonal thing. Um, it can happen between coworkers. It can happen between a coworker and a supervisor. It can happen between subordinates, customers and staff. Um, can anyone maybe give me an, an example about um, conflict? Maybe if uh, like one of your coworkers are not like slacking off a little bit, you might not like that. One of your coworkers and, are like slacking off, like not doing their work as much. Slacking like, off, like, yep. Like don't do their pay or something. Yep, that's a that's a big conflict, right? Not thinking that um, like you're pulling your weight, but that person's not pulling their weight, and now that that's a conflict, right? Um, Alexa, I want to um, acknowledge what you said that you had a hard time getting a job, a bartending job in New York City as a new transplant from the West Coast, and you guess uh, people thought that you would you wouldn't fit in with the staff and the customers, and it took a while to meet someone who gave you a chance. Yeah, fit right goes back to fit because they they perceive something. Okay, um, so where are we? Analyzing conflict, right? So what makes conflict arise? So there's a lot of different factors that could contribute to conflict in the workplace. So when I was putting together this workshop, um, I came across um, the work of uh, Dr. Sandra Collins, uh, an associate teaching professor of management at uh, Notre the University of Notre Dame. And she pointed out that conflicts are rooted in three major factors, situational, relationship, and personal factors. And so a situational factors refers to the physical environment as to which um, individuals are exposed, right? So that could be work-related stress. That's like the most common, right? The physical stress of being at work. Um, pressure from having to do more tasks in a shorter period of time, that can cause some conflict. Working in a highly competitive environment, um, concerns over job security, poor physical environment, right? Maybe it's too loud, it's too noisy, um, there's poor uh, air quality. There's so many different physical things that could happen in the workspace that can cause conflict, right? Um, the next one is uh, situational uh, factors can cause conflict, right? Um, so one thing that can also cause conflict is diversity in the workplace. And sometimes when we think about diversity, we're just thinking about 
race, ethnicity, gender, you know, different ages. But diversity can show up in a different way as well, right? People having different class, different religion, different educational backgrounds, right? That baggage can come up and people can respond to it. Um, and then that could cause conflict. Um, now relationships, right? They're built on communication between individuals and people anticipate the interaction that they have with another person based off of their experience from them in the past. So if you have a coworker that, you know, they always have an attitude. You may think you see them one day, like you're bracing yourself for that attitude, right? That's a past relationship with that person. And that could cause some type of conflict, right? Because of what we were expecting of that person. Um, also things that may cause conflict in the workplace is a power struggle, right? And power is a major aspect about relationships and it impacts the process of conflict management and power can be defined as the ability to perform an action or the possession of control or influence over others. And usually when there's a conflict around power, nobody wants to give up their perceived power, right? And that can cause some type of conflict in the workplace. Another thing that um, happens a lot in the workplace is um, a lack of trust, right? People don't always trust the other people to do their job, right? Um, especially if that person is not pulling their, their weight. So a lack of trust in your coworkers or in your supervisor, if you think that they don't got your back, Right, that also can um, cause some conflict. And then we also have uh, personal factors, right? That can cause conflict, right? Personality clashes. Um, I'm, Alexa, I'm wondering, um, coming from the West Coast to the East Coast, did you think that the New, the New Yorkers or the, the people up north in the East were a little, a little rough? I mean, I met some really nice people, I guess. Um, everything moved really fast. Luckily, I'm from Las Vegas, so like hospitality is really big there. Um, but I don't know. I felt like I was very eager to learn. So I always was asking questions. Then once I was more open to other people, they were immediately ready to help me. and. So my interpretation of New York was that everybody was really, really helpful and very knowledgeable. <laughs> but I think that was because of how I was addressing them first. So you did a little strategy, right? Definitely. Yeah. I was alone. So I didn't have anybody to, I don't know, guide me through. So I needed help from anybody who'd give it. Thank you. Thank you for that. I was just in Las Vegas the other day. So yeah. Big, big on hospitality, right? Um, but you know, you ask questions and you build relationships with people, right? So this quote that I have here, um, friendships, relationships, partnerships, and ownership and leadership and how far you sail is determined by who you let on your ship, right? And this is something that I heard along the way, right? And this quote is rooted in communication, right? Um, and all of these ships, right? Relationships, friendships, partnerships, ownership, le leadership, right? They bring us joy. But in order for them to be successful, we've got to have, you know, um, effective communication. So when we're facing conflict, um, people will choose different strategies uh, based on their communication style. Uh, therefore, resulting in a different outcome, a person's conflict management style refers to an individual's preferred way to respond to the conflict, right? And this is good to know in the workplace, right, on how you're going to respond to people or when things happen. And this is also a good skill to just, to just have in life to be able to, like, navigate different things. Because like we said, conflict can come up in the workplace and in our personal lives. So we have the competitive style, right? It's, a high, it's high in assertiveness and it's low in cooperation. And in this case, like one party in the conflict will take a firm stand to achieve his or her goals um, without seeking um, cooperation from the other per parties. So a person who takes a competitive style may say things like, this is your problem and not mine. Well, I don't have time for this, right? And then we have accommodating style, 
And this is the opposite of competitive. And this happens when the party is unassertive, but highly cooperative, right? And this person may uh, place a great emphasis on cooperating and they are willing to meet the needs of others before themselves, right? So you may see people are like, yep, whatever you decide, it's fine, so it's all good, right? Totally up to you, right? They're being very accommodating, right? Because they're kind of trying to avoid the conflict. They're trying to avoid having to deal with that, right? And then avoiding style, right? It scores low in both assertiveness and co uh, cooperativeness. And these people choose the style simply refusing to deal with it, right? They're indifferent to the outcome. They don't really care, right? Oh, I don't really wanna talk about it. Um, this is not my business, I ain't in it, right? These are indicators of people just totally avoiding it. And then we've got compromising style, right? This is a combination of both assertiveness and cooperating. And people who prefer a compromising style Right, they try to split the difference, right? They try to meet people in the middle. Both parties are expected to give something up in order for there to be a solution, right? So if you do this for me, then I'm gonna do this for you. I'm willing to sacrifice this if you're willing to give up that. It's, it's, it's a bit, it's a negotiation. And then finally, we have collaborative style, right? And this is considered to be the most effective resolution style when it comes to conflict. And this uh, style is highly assertive and highly cooperative. And unlike compromising style, which suggests that parties meet halfway and sacrifice something for their interests, the collaborative style encourages both parties to work together, right? To effectively meet their goals. Um, and they may say things like, I, I understand the situation. Um, how can I help you? Um, and both parties are willing to work together to reach the goal. All right, um, so I'm getting the 15 minute sign. So, and we're almost done. We've covered a lot today. So thank you. Any questions, any comments? All right, so let's power through, right? Cause we're almost done. So conflict resolution, right? It's an important skill to have in any sector. And we talked about how conflict can show up in your ships, in your relationships, in your friendships, in your partnerships. And it can occur between coworkers and supervisors and um, customers. Um, it can occur between groups. So thinking about everything that we've discussed, right? What is the best way to resolve conflict? I feel like in order to like solve the conflict, you need to talk to the other person, understand like where they're coming from, compromising or collaborating, like both is good for that situation. Yes. Communication, right? Bringing it all back, right? It's all about communication. So through effective communication, right? Conflicting parties will be able to accept the interests and the values of others, as well as achieve their own personal goals with collaborative mindsets, right? Realizing that the conflict is a mutual problem that can be solved through discussion instead of a one-way communication. Catherine, you was spot on, thank you. All right, so lastly, right? So when I'm developing today's presentation, right, um, all the articles that I read and went through about conflict resolution, they gave it in the perspective of a supervisor and how conflict resolution plays out in the workplace, right? So um, these tips are through what a supervisor is looking at, right? And this is how they may judge you in a work situation. So. A supervisor, the first thing they're going to do, right, is they're going to want to identify what's the source of the conflict. Both parties involved need to recognize that there is a problem. If you have a conflict with your coworker, right, you got to know, you got to be able to say what it is, what happened, what's happening with you. Um, and it's always good to have like some type of resolution. What, what do you want the outcome to be, right? So we hope in a perfect world, right, we hope that all the parties involved want to come to a mutual agreement to be able to address the issue and to find a resolution, right? So 
You need to know what the problem is, and then you need to know what you want to get out of, of the resolution, right? And in the work environment, a good supervisor will make sure that they take you into a safe, private place to talk. Everybody needs to have their say, right? So that requires active listening on your part, right? So now if the supervisor or the human resources person have to get involved, the process, they're gonna ask a lot of questions, right? Because they really wanna understand what the nature of the conflict is between the two parties. Especially if the conflict is between a supervisor and a subordinate, right? So a trained mediator or an HR professional, right? They're gonna ask each party to discuss how they feel. Right, and when they talk about how how are you feeling about this, this is a this is a way to be able to build trust. Right, we talked about like there's a lack of trust sometimes. Um, and then when developing a solution, the mediators are often looking for both parties to demonstrate a willingness to be able to come to a compromise. Right, to be able to reach a a, um, a solution, a resolution. And then lastly, what happens in the workplace is that supervisors, right, they're going to monitor the impact of the agreement. So the two parties came together, they came with a resolution, and they're going to they're gonna monitor to see how this plays out. And they're looking to see if there's going to be a change in the behavior. And if there's not, sometimes they may take steps to terminate or to discipline someone, right? Now, this is not to scare you to think that if you have a conflict in the workplace, and you're not able to resolve it, you'll be terminated. But rather to just inform you, right, about the thought process of supervisors and to help you just to know how to be able to like to govern yourself, right? Because there's always consequences, whether it's negative or whether it's positive. All right, so let's put everything together, everything that we learned today, and let's take a minute and let's read this. Does anyone want to read this aloud? We got a workplace conflict. And then let's think about how we're going to handle it. So um, would someone like to read out loud? I'll read it. Thank you. Uh, there is a new employee in the cubicle next to you. She seems very polite from your first impression, but have not had any personal interactions with her other than in passing to say good morning. It's been about three weeks and you start to notice that she plays her music a little too loud for your liking. You try to ignore it, but it's distracting you and interfering with your work. Would you, you would prefer she turn it down or off completely? So how are you gonna communicate this, right? Given everything that we learned today, how would you complete, uh, um, respond to this? And just jump in, just jump in. What would your response be? She's, she's always playing her music. Um, I think you should just like go to her and talk to her and then like you can tell her that she can listen to it maybe just not like in a high volume or like play another time when you're not there. I don't know. Mm. Anyone else? Thank you. You could both find like an agreement to something, like maybe ask her to put headphones on or just like your Lenny said to just lower the volume. Lucas said buy her some some earbuds. <laughs> yeah, so you know, like this is just this is just one of the things that can happen in the workplace, right? Um Hui says maybe you can go up to her and, and ask her politely to turn down the music, the volume of her music. Yeah. I, I think everyone gave, you know, great suggestions. And um, Alexa, explain uh, um, how the music is affecting your work. Yeah, it's really just about communicating what you're feeling and, and taking it to her instead of having an attitude about it, right? So let's see. So that concludes today. And um, I would love your feedback. Um, so if you could just take two minutes and maybe uh, fill out our feedback survey, um, because uh, I dropped it's an anonymous um, form, and this helps with liberated success programming. Um, and we're going to be back in two weeks on October 12th at 4:45. I'm going to talk about workplace technology. Thank you. 
And um, if you want to stay connected, this is the Liberated Success website. It's under construction. We're, uh, we're uh, making some changes. So it's going to be much prettier. Um, and this is our email info at liberatedsuccess.net. And we have Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter. So um, yeah.